Okay, hello and uh, and welcome to this event. This is a joint event between uh, IBM and the LJC. So we're very very pleased to have uh, some great sponsors with us today uh, with uh, IBM, and, and we're very proud to have IBM host uh, uh, this event, this joint event. Um, so this is going to be all about mad scientists. So I'm going to hand straight over to Steve. Um, but before that, I'm just going to say that the LJC is uh, has an awesome uh, sponsor, which is uh, Retworks. And without Retworks, the LJC literally wouldn't be here. So if everyone is unhappy with their job, should I say IBMs or not IBMs? Especially if you're <laughs> IBMs or, or definitely not IBMs. It's just a matter of how much you pay. Oh, okay, right. So, so unless you're an IBM, you yeah. should always you should go to, uh, to Retworks. If you're an IBM, read your small print in your contract. Yes, excellent. Yes. Um, so I'm going to hand over to, to Steve, cool. who's done a huge amount of work. Uh, for this event, so so big uh, big props to minutes Steve. and uh, and I'll hand over to you for the thank intro. you right so yes yeah, so um, I'm going to get out the way as quickly as I can but I need to give you some structure uh, so I'm Steve Paul work for IBM um, as Simon says been trying to make this thing this type of event happen for some time really glad to see you so thank you all for coming it's maybe a bit eclectic but bear with us because we think this is a really cool way of doing it. So I'm going to start. My first slide is, let's ignore the IBM and the RJC stuff. Right? This is a technology event. This is a tech fair. We hope that what, well, I hope what you do is you go off and talk to people. You go listen to some of the talks. You go talk to the guys who've got stuff out there, and you have a good time. You drink beer. You drink wine. Meet people who think like you do, who have fun. Right? It's all about technology for its own sake. We're not trying to sell you anything. We're trying to share our passion. And if part of that you like some of the stuff that IBM does, great. But primarily we're going, meet the guys, see the sorts of people that we have, see the fun stuff they do. So it's a different style of event. Um, I'll say thank you for Kate Evans, who's a friend of a friend, who did the doodles, who balked at the idea of doing caricatures of everybody turning up and did me a few nice doodles. So. Structure for, t for this evening, science fair. So you're going to have three keynotes, 20 minutes each, three, three, nine, three good speakers talking about their, their passions, their stuff, and then I'm going to ask you, leave the room, go out there, meet the guys, go talk to them. We have um, tweeting drones, we have tweeting um, dance floors, we have Arduinos, we have Raspberry Pis, we have things with your mind, we have cars, we have stuff. And the, the most important thing to understand about that stuff is it's coming from the heart. Most of these guys, not all of them, the one or two out here again paid to go off and talk to customers. Primarily though, you're meeting developers, people who do this for the fun of it. So we're trying to do this in parallel. So there'll be talks and demos. The talks, and I will say this to those of you who are talking, we've got slots, try and keep the time because we want to encourage people to, if you go and listen to a talk, when you finish, go to another one for sure, but go off and meet the guys who've come along and brought their hard work to show you. So you have this flowchart to follow, right? So 1945, that's a good year. Uh, 1945 is when we're supposed to be finishing here. Then go off. Um, I say talks in Babbage, it's actually talks in Fry. The whiteboard's got the updated stuff. But basically, pick a mix, go have fun, go talk to people, hands on, ask them stuff. If you've been to the website, you'll know that there we've put out some things about ask me, because ask these guys things. They have other things that they're interested in. And eventually, about 9 o'clock, come back here, and we'll do the wrap-up. And amazingly, there's a prize to be given, which is a BB-8. So I'll go to that in a second. Um, Here's the map of where we are. We're in the Fleming room, and the stuff is around them. So you know where it is. Go look. Go find the beer. Go wander around. Go talk to people. You know, Go around the corners. Go down the ends. There's good stuff happening. The extra talks were happening in the Fry room, which is the one that says Fry. Right. So more details. Um, I've got to do a plug. Excuse me. This is me adding my pay. Um, Two bits of paper. This is the IBM Blue Mix on your on your seat. The bottom QR code is the one that will get you to our Mad Scientist um, website. 
which was written by me, so you'll have to um, forgive the, uh, the clunkiness, but I'll give you some more information. Please go read that. Um, the whiteboard out there is if we have to change things, hopefully not too much. Um, I'll say about that. There's an IBM Bluebox relaunch, so please go do that. Um, if you're really, really exciting, excited, there's a competition. So if you haven't already gone to the ladies on the booth um, to register your details, you're missing out the opportunity to come back here at 9 and win a BB-8. And I believe Simon or Martin is going to be drawing it. It's a fight, you choose. Right? There's the question. Um, I'm sure there's, there's an obvious answer, but, but it's a prize draw. Okay, so you don't have to do anything. Take your pick, put the answer in, come back here at 9, one of you gets to walk away the BB-8. If you want to see BB-8 being driven by a mind, go watch Luke in the corner and talk to him about the, the scars. Okay, um, so dance floor, it's just good stuff. Go, go talk to people. So, that's me. On to the fun stuff. We have three keynotes for you. And now we have the fun of moving people around. I'm going to hand over now to Dave, who's the guy who's come with the, the fantastic robot. And then I'm going to get out of the way, and we'll hope that Holly will follow, and then Laura. Have fun. When that's finished, leave this room. If you're interested in any of the talkers, be in the other talk thing. Obviously, come back. But really, go off and talk to people. This is meant to be a fun thing. Drink beer, talk to people. Thank you. Dave. Right. Okay, I'm Dave. That's Romy. Just give me a second while I get Romy up to speed and then we'll go. Can I remember my IP address after having? So, um, getting emotional about robots and uh, closure. So, most people, if you're like me, or maybe not, we ask them why. Why are social robots? Why emotions and why closure? So, um, if you're like me and you hang out in various dark places of the web, like Indiegogo, you might find a whole slew of social robots appearing in the last couple of years. There's now, there's Pepper, there's Jibo, which might actually be arrived from this year sometime. Um, there's also Buzzy, there's Alpha 2, there's Ido, there's Ollie. And all these appearing in the last couple of years, apart from now, who's a bit an old and things. Um, you might be asking why. What, what, what's, the, what's the thing that's driving this right now? And so I, I'm going to take on that, and you maybe dis disagree. But I'd like to start talking about. User, think about user interfaces. So I like to start, th start thinking about Gibson, but not that Gibson. What I actually mean is uh, James and Eleanor, Eleanor Gibson, and they developed the theory of affordances. And an affordance is basically an action uh, possibility in the environment. So it's something that the environment affords you. It's an action you can take, and it's independent of the agent. Um, but 
the agent has to be able to take that action. It has to be able to perceive and discover the actions possible and has to be capable of doing it. So a small child, for example, might see the door handle but be too small to reach it. And affordances sometimes give you a clue about what they can do. So you, know, you push that side, you pull that side. So let's think about user interfaces in terms of affordances. So we start the command line. The affordance of the command line is, um, yeah, look, look at the funny robot. It's <laughs> trying to steal the show. Um, I'll explain what, what she's doing in a minute. So the, the command line, the, the affordance is text strings. And there's not a lot of discoverability in the ship of man page. Um, then we move on to Windows icons, menus, and mouse pointers. And we, sort of, we can use a metaphor. And that way, people can find out what you can do by looking at the menu, by looking at the icons, by moving this around. And then some people thought, well, actually, wouldn't it be a really good idea if we could make the affordances on the computer look the same as they do in real life? So people started thinking about virtual reality and having a 3D world where you could literally go and grab things. And people had a whole bunch of dodgy ideas and came up with various games. It's great for games, but the problem with wearing a headset is it cuts you off in the real world. So, OK, you can, you can put the virtual affordances out to the real world. And therefore, you can sort of have a more collaborative style interface. The uh, UI actually physical. You can make a, a really physical object that you can manipulate. And if anyone likes sort of um, old style analog synths, you have that, 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 that same idea. You're manipulating physical things. So this is a gratuitous reason for me to put to my children. And um, by, by that, I don't even. <laughs> the reason that they're, they're, they're there is that I'm going to suggest that if you had an interface that behaved like a human, you could use the skills um, you learn from dealing with other humans to use it. And there are some examples of that already in production. This is Baxter. And Baxter's an industrial robot, but it's not like most industrial robots. If you go to a factory and see an industrial robots, normally they're caged away because they're dangerous things. They don't have any awareness of what's going on around them, and you know, they, they move fairly fast. Baxter's designed to work next to people to give cues about what it's doing. So you see it has a hook of where it's going to manipulate next. So you get it. If it's going to move that, it looks what it's going to do. But what it's going to do, it doesn't just swing its arms around madly. Uh, and the ex it has expressions too. So the expressions will show if it's puzzled. If it has a confused expression, you know, okay, something's, something's gone wrong. But, you know, you might say, well, let's make things look exactly like humans. And this guy, Hiroshi Jigu, is trying to do exactly that. And uh, one of those is an Android. Which one? Um, now, I find creepy. And they don't look too bad in this year's photo. When you see them move and it's a going like a goldfish, you think, no, no that, that's not human. That's Of a, of a god in such a way that people can, can, can uh, interact with it. And today, when we say avatar, we mostly mean what you look like online. 
but that was the original meaning. And, and science fiction still uses some of that meaning. So I don't know if anyone reads Ian M. Banks. Um, so Ian M. Banks has, has this um, whole series of books about called the culture. And one of the features of the culture is you have these fairly massive ships, uh, very intelligent, huge, you know, city size, brains the size of a planet and everything. And so they're far too big for humans to interact with. And so what these ships tend to have, they have cells. They have representations of the ship that's human-sized, that the crew can interact with. And um, Gene Rodman's Androida has, has the same thing. It's a battleship ship there, and it has a, an Android avatar, which is the thing that's human-sized that the crew and the passengers can interact with. So I guess that's, that, that's kind of my um, justification for why you want artificial social robot. It can be an avatar for something that's more complex, possibly a smartphone. And it's not, if you look at most of the Indiegogo uh, projects, you find that a lot of them, they always say smart home. It can deal with your smart home, it can control your stuff. Okay, I, I said I'll talk about emotions and why emotions. Now, it's a kind of standard thing um, in science fiction that emotions are bad, they're more primitive, they, um, you know, they're, they're somehow something wrong with us. And if only we could emotion, be logical, everything would be better. This guy would disagree. So Charles Darwin actually spent a fair amount of his time thinking about emotions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thinking about emotions. I've been off stage today. Um, and he came to believe that they were actually really important. He came to believe that they had evolved to help us survive, um, done by helping us to form bonds, by helping us to collaborate. Um, Help us to avoid poison, so they're not discussed. And modern psychiatrists, at least some of them, tend, tend to agree with him. So there's a guy called Paul Ekman, and he says that um, it's a simple idea, but a central one. Emotions evolved from chaos to deal quickly with the most vital events of our lives. So he's saying it's sort of a prioritization mechanism that helps us deal with things, um, even if we haven't completely thought them through consciously. So you might say, okay, well, that's how humans work. Why, do we, why would we want robots to do the same? And okay, I'll, I'll argue that personality might be one of those. I mean, one, a lot of the robots that we know from fiction that, we, that are most appealing are the other ones that have some personality. Um, now, a friend of mine maintains that if he had a robot, there, he would not want it to have, emotion, have emotions because after five days it would surely kill it. And if, if, if you believe that, you might think, oh, right, okay. Is there another reason why you would want an emotional robot? And I'm afraid I'm going to put some more psychologists at you. So, uh, I'm not going to write about that in the room. Found an artificial agent without effect, so that's a facial expression of emotional state, are taken by humans interacting with them as being disinterested or even inhumane. That is, interactive a um, agents are perceived by humans with an inherent emotional bias. So, in the absence of emotional response in them, it seems something missing, not something being neutral, as it would be in the household appliance. So in other words, we've got ourselves into trouble, we've come up with this nice robot, and now it has to be emotional, we think it's going to kill us, effectively. This, this robot's not a kill gun, robot, so just, just to put my mind at rest. So if you're going to build an emotional robot that's staring at you in a very <coughs> horrible way, um, what, what would my own model look like? Well, obviously you'd have to have some sort of emotional state. Um, you'd have to have the world. And you'd have some set of motivations, the, the things that, that drive you. So there's you know, a desire to avoid harm. If you're a robot, a desire your battery doesn't go flat. Um, maybe a desire to be sociable, to interact with people, to learn stuff. And those emotions, they, sorry, those motivations, they act in your emotional state. You know, that they, depending on how satisfied or unsatisfied they are, they change how the agent feels. But that's not much good unless you can perceive the world. And so we have a whole bunch of recognizing processes that perceive both the external world and internal world and look for certain cues and send percepts on pieces of information they perceived to the motivations, which then go and update the emotional model. So how you feel depends to a certain extent on what's happened and what surrounds you, what you can perceive. And that wouldn't be much good if you couldn't do anything about it. So of course the next stage is you have some process look at your emotional model and they take they, they um, take actions. So depending on what state you're in, they decide, okay, I need to take an action to correct 
or to make my state better. Now, the reason I've got these lines going back here is that as well as taking action, you ought to perceive that you're taking action. So all this then feeds back into motivations, and again, I bet your emotional state. But again, you need memory. You need to know, remember what you've felt, what you're feeling, and how it's affected you, and how the things that you perceived change your emotional state. So you see in short-term memory, there are things that are you know, particularly interesting might get promoted into long-term memory, and then Again, they, they can, in turn, affect how you perceive it. So if you perceive um, a robot the first time, you might have a sort of generic response. And then you might learn that actually one has been really irritating and really annoying. And next time you see it, it's ah. So again, the system has to learn. OK? So closure. The last why was closure. And I said that I would show you the closure of the answer to everything. And I'm sorry I lied. I did. I can show you why I like closure. Uh, that's probably about the best I can do. So there's a famous quote from Alan Perlis, which says, it's best to have 100 functions operate on one data structure and 10 functions in 10 data structures. And before I started using Clojure, I didn't really understand that. Because if, you, if you were writing Java code, you'd probably consider very bad style if you decided, well, actually, I'm not using classes. I'll have maps, I'll have lists, I'll have strings. What do I want these classes for? And I've, I've seen Java code like that, and it's not pleasant. But in Clojure, that actually really works because Clojure provides a whole bunch of functions that are very good at manipulating data structures, and it provides a very good, nice set of data structures to use. Um, I'd argue that it's simple. The syntax isn't incredibly small, um, but it's powerful. You, you can change the language by writing macros. Um, it has as good a Java interop as using Java from Java, pretty much. It has a whole bunch of stuff, like destructuring. You can pull you can pull collections apart really easily. You can test code as you go using the, using the uh, interactive environment. It has great um, libraries like Core Async, which lets you write async code in a way that looks like you're writing blocking code. So it's easy to read, but it's actually async under the hood. Um, you have Clojure Script, so you can write on your same language in your clients as in your server. And there's a really great community around it, it's certainly in London. Um, so that's, that's the three whys. Maybe they're convincing. But there's one thing I haven't mentioned. Talk about AI. It's like Godwin's law. Eventually, it comes back to Skynet. And so I kind of felt like I couldn't quite escape Skynet completely. Um, but there's an interesting paper called The Singularity May Never Be Near by Toby Walsh. Um, and it's worth reading. It's only four pages. But he he um, provides some interesting arguments as to why, actually, this whole idea of the singularity may, may not work at all. There's a whole bunch of embedded assumptions in there that mean that you know, just because we have something smart, it's not going to take over the world. Um, AlphaGo is probably not going to come and kill you, even though it's good, pretty good uh, to go. So that's me. You've been seeing Romy here shifting around, and you might be wondering what she's been doing. What she has been doing. Yeah. So Romy has been running the emotion model that I was talking about. And and a sort of view there of emotional state. Uh, has a whole bunch of motivations. And, and the web app is not doing very much. Never done with robots. Yep. OK, that's better. So you can see that we probably can't read, but these are a bunch of things that we're um, perceiving. So what she's been actually doing is she's been face tracking, so looking for people. And she generally, she generally make, tends to be happy when she sees people, and there's a lot of people there, so that's probably why she's going, yippee, yippee. Um, looking at the keywords, so she particularly likes to hear about robots. So, um, and <laughs> and yeah, if nothing happens, she gets bored and starts shuffling around. Um, so, that, so that's basically, that, that, was, that was the model I was, I was talking about, it's actually running on the robot. And <coughs> so you, you can see the, this thing here is graphing the, uh, the various persons. So the blue one there, that's boredom. So <laughs> I'm a bit bored now. I think it's time I should, pretty time I should finish. So I will. Yeah. Thank you. So are you going to be around 
with your robot if people have questions. Yeah, I'll be I'll be hanging around. Yeah. Laptop shuffling. Yes, yes. <laughs> Unmute. Stop sharing. It's, I think it's sort of, it seems to have crashed a bit because it doesn't do anything when I click stop sharing, which is a bit sad, really. You mirrored. Um, I'm not even plugged in actually. So oh, okay. Excellent. How's that? So the, w the garage, we're, we're really all about innovation. So we use design thinking, we use lean startup, we use extreme programming, and that allows us to do quite short, fast, in innovative projects for clients. We're normally, we're based um, in Moorgate in London. We, we do occasionally, we do pop-up garages and we travel around. So today, for example, um, we're going to investigate and, and kick off a project with the Dutch Bank in Amsterdam. And you'll, you'll notice this boarding card. Um, the name is Dominic Harris. I am not Dominic Harris, I am Holly Cullens. And you'll notice it's getting back at, at 7 o'clock. And the reason this is interesting is because that was actually supposed to be me. And then I looked at the calendar and I went, oh dear, and I tried to figure out a way that I could be in Amsterdam and then get back, and it wasn't going to work. Uh, so my colleague went instead. And the reason is that 
I think Steve said it, this looks amazing. There's, it, there's so much cool stuff here. So, you know, we've got the emotional robots, which we just saw, which I love. I don't think there's anything better than a bored robot. We've got the BB-8, which has to be the second best thing. The only thing better would be maybe bored BB-8, but we haven't, we haven't mastered that yet. We've got zombie bunnies, which I said emotional robots were the best thing, but actually I take it back because zombie bunnies is the best thing. So, you know, it all just looks so cool. So, yay. But, but then there's sort of a question, which is that I'm looking at the list, and there's so many amazing things. And I think, well, why am I here? What, you know, what have I done to, to, to be here? And for this event, then, you know, what that really is, is am I mad enough to be here? So you may have heard of this as imposter syndrome, which is a, a feeling a lot of us have that we, we, you know, we shouldn't be where we are. And, and, and why did everybody not see that we we're not worthy? Um, in this case, I think it's a sort of a novel form of imposter syndrome because we don't usually phrase it as, am I mad enough, when we talk about imposter syndrome. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the things that, that I've done. Because um, I, I thought about it, and I thought, well, actually, I, I probably do have the science part OK. So how many people here um, did physics degrees at university? Three. Yeah. And any, any of you do? PhDs in physics? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah see, there's, there's always at least one. Um, so I, I did a PhD in physics as well, and I did quantum computation. And what I did was I did NMR implementation of quantum computation. And so NMR, it's, um, it's like MRI, but for chemicals instead of people. And we used NMR techniques in order to implement quantum computers. And this was, I think, in some ways our most notable paper that, that I and my supervisor did, and it was published in Physics Review Letters, so I was quite pleased with it. And, and you'll notice that, that that's B, so quite pleased. Um, so I, I've, I've only got a short amount of time, um, so I'm not going to give you a really detailed discussion of quantum computation, because I think it, it's more than can fit. But I'll, I'll give you the, uh, the elevator pitch for quantum computation, which is in classical compu computation, if you, if you reduce everything down to its most basic form, you have a bit. And a bit has two states. It's got a 0 and a 1. And you can't make anything simpler than that. That's the absolute, sim absolute simplest thing. With quantum computation, the absolute simplest thing, where you can't reduce it down any further, is a lot more complex. Instead of being just two point, two levels, it's a sphere. And your state could be any point on that sphere. And this is where quantum computation get, gets its power, because it means in a bit, instead of storing just a 0 or a 1, you can store a point on a sphere. And that's a lot of information. And then it means when you do computations with your bits, all of a sudden, you have the power to, to potentially get amazing results out that, that you, know, you couldn't get in any kind of sensible time with classical computation. So you're all experts on quantum computation now. Quantum computation, that a state change, instead of flipping a bit from 0 to 1 to 0 to 1, what you're doing instead is you're doing a rotation on a sphere. But of course, in the real world, you'd say, perhaps, I want to rotate it 90 degrees, so it's going to go from here to here. But it's operating with, with a digital system, you know, a 0 and a 1. You can't really go wrong flipping something from 0 to 1. Or if something goes wrong, you know it really quickly, because you, it was zero, you try to make it one, it's still zero. When you're operating on, on the surface of a sphere, it's a lot more subtle, and there are things that can go wrong. You could think you were going to rotate it 90 degrees to there, but actually your equipment's not perfect, so you went 91 degrees. But it turns out that this is a problem which is really well known in NMR, because they use similar techniques. And the, the technique that they've come up with to fix this is called composite rotation. And what happens here is, is an interesting one, where instead of going from 0 to 90, I go from, unfortunately, I'm not multi-joint, so it doesn't have to manage that, but you sort of go all the way around, and then you go around a little bit more, and then you switch direction, you go around here, and then you go back, and then you go back. And the net effect of all of that is that the errors cancel each other out. So instead of having, say, a 1 degree problem, you've got a 0.1 degree problem. And that's potentially very useful. So you're, you're building fault tolerance into the system which is good engineering. And so this was known in chemistry circles, but it wasn't really known in physics circles. And the, the use cases in chemistry were fairly specific. And in, for implementing algorithms, we needed much more general use cases. 
So I, this is what I worked on for the, the other part of my thesis. And so I came up with resonant, resonance offset tailored pulses for NMR quantum computation. And the, the chemistry people, they really like coming up with acronyms. And so I looked at that and I said, well, I need an acronym for this. What's the natural acronym? Rotten. So I came up with the rotten pulse sequence. And then I, I kept going. And so then I, I, my supervisor and I wrote this paper. And um, here's a, a, an excerpt from it. So we have the corpse pulse sequence and the scrofulous sequence. Um, so probably all of you know the word corpse because it's a, a, a word we, well, we don't use it very often, but we do use it. Um, scrofulous may be less familiar to some of you. It's a really old-fashioned word for tubercul tuberculosis. So I was really pleased that I managed to get an acronym to fit it. Um, and when I was preparing this talk, I, re I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to talk about this. And I remembered rotten, and I remembered scrofulous, but I'd forgotten about corpse. So I was sat in the Bloomings Garage office, and I was pulling up this paper, and I had the worst giggling fit because I remembered corpse. And it's not cool to laugh at your own jokes, but it was a long time ago, so I figure I'm allowed to, to laugh. And my colleagues thought it was really uncool to laugh at my own jokes because I explained it to them, and they were still pretty, pretty blank-faced. So, so this was kind of fun, you know, and I had a lot of fun coming up with corpse and scrofulous, but it was ultimately a bit silly, wasn't it? Well, it turns out that that didn't actually matter. So I, I Google, when I was searching for the papers, just showed me the citation counts. And so you'll see that this one here, Quantum Phony, published in Physics Review Letters, very good journal, got 99 citations. Cool. This one here, the one with scrofulous and scrofulous, 171 citations. So by, I think it was the material rather than the acronyms. But it, either way, it, it meant that the, the madness you know, wasn't an impediment. So you know, then we have sensible paper, and then we have the bonkers paper. And the bonkers paper beat the sensible paper. Um, and so when I, was, when I was Googling it, I hadn't done this. Um, but then I, saw, I thought, well, I'm just going to look at some of the citations, because Google was showing them. So I was really impressed by this. This is you know, a Japanese research group. And they're reading my paper. And then they're writing sentences like, one could alternately try a concatenation of three scrofulous pulses under the condition that they compose the corpse, which I thought was awesome. <laughs> and this one, I think I like even better. You can see we have the classic examples of scrofulous. So I came up with something that was classic, and it's called scrofulous. So that, that was a long time ago. Um, so if, if we fast forward, I joined IBM. I've done a bunch of things in IBM, but a lot of it has to do with WebSphere. And a couple of years ago, we came up with a product called WebSphere Liberty. And what WebSphere Liberty did was take something that had been really powerful, but frankly kind of big, and make it really small, really lightweight, really cool. And so then what we started doing was we started, and when I say we, actually I mean Simon in the front. Simon. <laughs> I have to give Simon credit where it's due. Simon worked out that we could take Webster and Liberty and run it on a Raspberry Pi. And this was a first generation Raspberry Pi. So it was kind of cool. So I, I looked and I said, well, Simon did this and it's really cool. So I need to do something that's either better or worse, but I can't do the same thing. So what I did is I did the Webster hat, where I took the server and I embedded it in a Raspberry Pi. And then I took the Pi and I put it in a hat. And I had to use a chef's hat because a Raspberry Pi is small, but it's not that small. Um, and so that was the world's first wearable application <laughs> server. You know, it was, a, it was a niche market, but I, I cornered it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so here we have the evidence as well. And the thing that Laura took this picture, this again is pretty incredible to see. The thing I love about this picture on this PC is I had wireless problems. So that's an Ethernet picture. It's <laughs> 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 making way. And I was, co you know, I was, I was coding an application server that was sitting on my head. Um, so dignity pretty low, but you know, I did it first. So then, then I carried on, and I thought, well, the, the hat was good, but only I could really interact with the hat in a physical way. So I came up with the WebSphere Sphere, which is the cuddly throwable application server. Um, and unfortunately, I, can't, I have it running, and I can connect to it, but I can't connect to the, to the Wi-Fi at the same time, and this is going out by a Hangout. Um, so you'll have to take my word for it, that there is actually an application server running on this. And you'll see that. When I throw it, it flashes. And if someone hits the web page, it also flashes. And so I can send that out. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, I had um, an interesting technical challenge with that, because I had to make it padded enough that it could survive treatment like that. Um, and you'll notice I still wince every time. But at the same time, 
padding and computers isn't a great combination. Yeah. <laughs> so, and here's another picture of um, in Bournemouth, the, the sphere getting thrown around. And so there's the URL, which I, I can't access. And so I, I talked to my mom, and I said, you know, look, I've done this amazing thing. I worked really hard on this. I'm so proud. And she said, but <laughs> I have, what's the liability insurance like for uh, <laughs> Then she said, why would anybody want an application server in a cuddly ball? And you know, then I felt a bit deflated, because I actually couldn't think of any good reason why anybody would want this. So I think we've, we've covered science, scientist. Um, and I'll maybe leave Matt for, for you to decide. I, I, I won't comment. Um, but I definitely, I'm in an awesome tradition. Of, so this is Hennig Brand. And he was an alchemist in the 60, 1660s. And he was trying to discover gold, or discover a way of making gold. And what he invented instead, or discovered, was phosphorus. Uh, so this is a picture of him with his phosphorus. The cool thing about it is it glows, so he got a glowing liquid. Um, and he was also the first person to discover an element. On the element here, we have phosphorus on the periodic table. <coughs> You'll notice that the, um, the, the letter for phosphorus is P, which is appropriate. We'll come back to that. Because the way he discovered phosphorus was he took a lot and a lot of P, and he boiled it. And then there was sort of this complicated chemical process which took him several months, which is why he was the first person to discover it. But the net effect was that he got a glowing liquid. Um, and I, I know, that I think there's a lot of similar crazy scientific discovery stories, but I know this one because my roommate did it in chemistry. And she came back and she said, what would make someone think, I know, I'm going to boil my own pee? It, 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 it's, so, you know, again, maybe on the mad threshold, you know, mad enough to make a throwable application server, I'm happy to report, I'm not mad enough to boil, boil my urine. So, there we go. And um, Henrik Brandt, he was in a, a tradition, uh, I think, of gentleman scientists. So there wasn't grant bodies or anything like that. So in, in order to, to fund his experiments with urine, he had to have independent means. And the way he did this was he married well. <laughs> um, and he got a lot of money, but unfortunately pee costs money, and boiling pee costs money. So he worked through his pile of cash, but it was okay because luckily his wife died. So he married again and got another pile of cash, but worked through that one as well. Um, and even after discovering phosphorus, he still found himself pretty, pretty without money. And the reason was that he couldn't think of a use for phosphorus. He was looking for gold. He found phosphorus. It was a bit of a disappointment. And it turns out that phosphorus is actually incredibly useful for all sorts of things. For example, matches, fireworks, <coughs> lethal weapons. That's good. And I think, you know, there's so many of these stories of someone who invented something and they thought, oh, this was a real disappointment and it actually turned out to be useful. There's a, a similar one with post-it notes. You know, they were looking for a really sticky glue and they found this useless unsticky glue, which has actually revolutionized the world now. And if you take that to its extreme, then you can sort of say, well, if some useless things are useful, then every useless thing is useful. And I, I think maybe that's a, a bridge too far. I don't know. Um, so I was thinking about uselessness, and of course, that brings up the subject of chocolate teapots. And I think we can all agree that a chocolate teapot is a genuinely useless article, right? Yeah, uh, which you can buy for 25 pounds. Um, and it turns out that a chocolate teapot can actually be used for making really good hot chocolate because you put the milk in and then you pour it out and it just carries just the right amount of chocolate to it. Or at least that's the theory. I suspect it's actually mostly useful for making money for Firefox. And I was thinking about a, another, another sort of metric for, for utility, and that's how many people it's useful for. Um, so this is a project that we're doing in the garage at the moment, um, because Simon Wheatcroft is a blind ultramarathon runner, and his story is absolutely incredible in terms of the, the determination that he's shown in taking something that's really, really, really hard, like running ultramarathons, and then he's got this <coughs> challenge, which is that he can't actually see where he's going, which is kind of important when you're running, and you know he's he's absolutely managing it, and um. The, what he's doing at the moment, or what he's going to be doing at the end of April, is the Four Deserts Challenge. And so he's going to be doing one leg of that in Namibia. And it's a 250-kilometer run in the desert. Um, and so we were talking to him about what some of the challenges would be. And I've actually edited, edited this for um, not 
horrifying everybody too much because some of the things he was describing were just really, really gruesome. But you know, he knew that even if the worst didn't happen, even if the normal happened, he'd be dealing with like he'd have to run through blisters that were bleeding. And you know he'd have to be doing like minor surgery on himself in the in the in the desert, and his toenails would be falling off, and dehydration was pretty much inevitable, which then makes him vomit, which of course makes the dehydration worse. And so it's like you know you have to manage that. Um, and so again, I think in that case we absolutely we've got mad coverage, right? Um, so Simon, the. Blind runners have run the Four Deserts Challenge before, and the way that they usually do it is they run with an assistance runner, so the runner will have something like bells and will run near them, and then you can follow the sound of the bells, and, and it's okay. Um, but he wanted to do more than that, and he wanted to be the first person to run it solo, so no assistance at all. Um, but if you can't see, then of course you really do need some technology to help you with that. And so what we're doing in the Blue Garage is we're going to... Um, write him an app and it's going to beep if he shifts off his path and that, you know, a bit like a car reversing guide and that should be enough. And our original thinking was that we would have it say, go to the left, go to the right, uh, but he said that he didn't want that because he was concerned that if he heard voices, they would be hallucinations and instead he wants beeps. Uh, so this is a, a something that we're going to have to validate with him because we've been listening to beeps in the office for about a week <laughs> and I can tell you, you can hallucinate beeps really easily. <laughs> so, you know, we're going to have to do the, you know, we're all, we're all about the feedback and, you know, getting it to him and then having him come back and say, you know what, why did I ask for beeps? Can I, can I just have voices instead? But we'll see. It, it, it. And um, so th this is a him in the garage. And the reason the photo looks like this is that he has a guide dog, and the guide dog is absolutely adorable. And so the whole time he was in the garage, I was taking photos of the dog. And so this is the, the closest I've got to a photo of him, which is his feet and, and his dog. And this is the uh, the app on my phone. And so you can see it sort of, it, it is quite cool. And again, you know, thinking about utility. So how many of you ultramarathon runners? No, 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 no hands up. Okay, how many of you blind? Any, any, anyone blind? Excellent. One. So, I think the market for apps for blind ultramarathon runners is probably going to be fairly limited. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to generalize too much and, and you know cut things off, but you know, it's, it's a pretty small number of people. And so, why, why is this worth doing? It's, I mean, it's worth doing for a number of reasons. I think one of that is. One of them is that it enables Simon, and he's so, so much pushing the limits of what's possible. And that really enriches all of us, even if we're not ourselves running desert, you know, desert marathons. And technologically as well, it's such an interesting problem in terms of the user interface challenges. So it's, it's, it's really cool. So, any, any, I think I have, oh no, I don't have time for questions. I had time for questions, and then I and then I talked too long about Simon. But uh, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to seeing all your comments. Thank you. Laura, do you wanna? Go. Right, so this is a, a 
joint project with my colleague Andy Stanford Clark, who couldn't be here tonight, and anyone who knows him knows him as quite a mad scientist. Um, but we came up with this project together, so um, I said I'd present it tonight. So every time I boil the kettle in my flat, it tweets as at ambient kettle. And my mum subscribes to this account on Twitter. So every time I boil my kettle, my mum receives a tweet saying that I've boiled the kettle. And it's, this isn't about monitoring me or anything. If I don't make a cup of tea, she doesn't like call the police and check that I'm still alive or anything. Generally, she probably wouldn't notice. It's just that uh, she and my dad live 250 miles away. And so we can't just sit down, have a cup of tea and a chat very easily. So. Um, this kind of brings a tiny little bit of my quite separate life um, to them. Uh, so I have a cup of tea, and they may or may not have a cup of tea with me. But if they do, sometimes they even tweet back to say that they're having a cup of tea as well. Um, yeah. So it's that little bit of ambient connectedness, as we called it. This is made possible because my kettle has an individual appliance monitor in it. So literally. That's the kettle plug, and that goes in between it and the socket. And it detects how many watts the kettle is currently pulling. Um, so when there's no watts, it's because it's off. 3,000 watts, it's on. It's fairly straightforward. And the appliance monitor, uh, every six, se six seconds, sends the number of watts to the display. And that's connected to an Arduino-based bridge, which is plugged into my router. That sends a message to the sky. Um, and it ends up in a cloud somewhere, and I can get um, graphs out of it. Or my colleague Andy can make it send a Twitter uh, tweet. So without actually doing anything explicit, just by switching the kettle on, I can share some little part of my life with my parents and have this virtual cup of tea with them. So then we got to thinking, could we make a physical representation instead of just having the, the Twitter account? So we started looking at what the user experience was of using a kettle and listing out the main features. So obviously, it heats water. We probably wouldn't be trying to do that because otherwise we'd just have a kettle. It's got a familiar physical shape that UK kettles are typically these plastic jugs now. Physical size, it has to be um, enough for more than one cup of tea, usually, because it's kind of a sociable, sociable thing. You make tea for somebody else often, as well as yourself. It uses a lot of electricity in a short amount of time, which is kind of key to us being able to detect that it's on in the first place. And that thick kettle that provides power to the kettle is kind of convenient from a visual point of view, because we're going to need power to whatever physical representation we create. Um, going to the top. We've got the kind of the click noise, and that gives feedback. So when you start boiling the water or heating the water, it clicks on. And then the second click shows that it's boiled. And similarly, between the clicks, you get the bubbling and whooshing sounds. And that's, again, feedback that you get in your tea sooner. Some kettles, and this is partly what sparked it, because Andy had just got a, a color-changing kettle. Um, and it, as the water heats up, as the temperature changes, the colour of the kettle or a light in the kettle also changes from maybe from like a blue colour through to red to show the temperature change. And kind of importantly, uh, it just works. You don't need to configure it. You don't need to search into your kettle to make it work. Um, you just yeah. plug. <laughs> you just plug it in, and it just it just does what it's meant to do. So we had to pick out the um, the physical the physical the features of the kettle that we wanted to use to create this physical representation of, of the Twitter account, and it needed to be things that kind of seemed important to the user experience, but also that were kind of relevant to having this remote physical representation. So we started off, or Andy started off with version one. We had the clicky sounds, because that was kind of easy to do. It's a little click web file. And the whole thing started as a Perl script, um, just on his laptop. And so every time the um, kettle reading came out as 3,000 watts, he knew the kettle was switched on. And so he would start the first click, play the first click. And then this little um, Blink one, I think it was an Indiegogo or a Kickstarter campaign at some point. Um, it's just a USB LED notification light. 
um, and you'd start that colour changing gradually from purple to red. And then at a reasonable time, it would click again, and you'd get the, the sound going, uh, you'd get the sense of the kettle going off. So the kind of the colour and the, thanks notes, the colour and the sound together kind of made a sort of soothing experience. Um, obviously, it's not very kettle-like yet, but it kind of got that representation across. Um, so wherever you had your laptop, you had this representation. But because that sticks out from the laptop, if you want to carry a laptop anywhere, you have to unplug it, because otherwise it snaps off. Um, and obviously, the laptop has to be on and connected to the internet somehow. So this is the second incarnation, which sort of looks less attractive in some ways, but we'll get there. Um, so because of this kind of dependency on the laptop, he changed to having the software on a Viglum PC, uh, so, which you probably remember them. They're sort of small PCs, quite low powered, can always be on at home. So it would always be on, so you didn't have that kind of timing problem. Um, and he had the, we've got the, the changing thing still plugged in up there, and it was plugged straight into the router, so it always had its own um, internet connection, and it could be plugged in and left on for power supply all the time. But yeah, it doesn't look much like a kettle yet. Um, it's not even that attractive, and Mum couldn't just move it around the house because it's not that uh, robust, and it's a little computer with bits hanging off it, and it's just not that nice. So we had to think about the sort of standalone appliance idea because the kettle is your original appliance that you just plug it in, it just works. Um, as I say, no configuration needed. So this time, this is obviously a Raspberry Pi. All the software got moved across to that. It's got its little speaker and its light. And it plugs directly into a router still but no configuration needed by the person who plugs it in. You plug it in, it boots, and it just works. Um, same for the power side of it. And at this point, I did the uh, whooshing sound to go with the clicks. So basically, it's like a kettle at this stage, kind of, um, but it still doesn't look much like one. So at this point, Andy went down to Toys R Us <laughs> and bought a kettle. So it, it looks more like a kettle. Um, it's got your cable out the back, which is kind of nice. Uh, it looks a bit like it's got water in it. And it even lights up, given time. So it's... Um, this one's connected to the, G, uh, the GSM network, so it's got SMS connectivity, allegedly, <laughs> at this point. OK, you cheat. OK, I think I might have worked out why it's not working. OK, we'll, we'll demo that in a minute when it's come back online. So, um, yeah, so we've got the, the kettle, and it's... Um, that's what it looks like inside. So it's got a Raspberry Pi with the software on it again. And there's a 3G dongle there. And it's got a, it's an LED board, sort of multicolored light notification thing again. And it, uh, as I say, you can connect to it through the GSM network then. So the benefit of having the Pi means that you could have uh, Node-RED on it. So Node-RED's a graphical um, programming interface. Um, you create flows like that, basically. And the, um, the, app but the application itself is up in the cloud. So you don't need to, again, coming back to the searching into your kettle thing, you don't need to log into the kettle just to be able to change the application. So if the click is annoying at night, say, you can just go to your cloud and change when it comes on and off. So when I boil my kettle now, my real kettle, um, the in the individual appliance monitor, 
was provided by Kuracost. It goes to, uh, it sends a message to the current cost gateway, the bridge, which through MQTT sends a message up to the Watson IoT platform in the cloud. Um, that passes it across to Bluemix. Um, in Bluemix, there's a, another instance of Node-RED, which then processes that and sends a text message using Twilio to the kettle which is on its 3D dongle, and in the kettle, as I say, there's another instance of Node-RED, which then processes that and makes the kettle do or not do what it's meant to do, which in this case would be to boil. So, just about to see it's changed colour now. It did its little click. It's got an MP3 plane in it now. We moved off from WAV files to MP3s. And there you go, you can just about probably see it changes colour. And there you go. So you could have that on your shelf in, at home. Or in this case, my mum could have it on a shelf at home. And that's how I have a virtual cup of tea with my parents 250 miles away. Thank you. So, how many people here have got some pizza?